Very excited to be here. Very excited to be here uh, in person uh, and with you guys today. So uh, as mentioned, my name is Stephen Lyon. For those that don't know me, I've been with Chick-fil-A for 13 years now. I've had several different roles uh, throughout my career. I started in restaurant food safety, doing a little bit of regulatory work. Uh, then I went to supply chain, uh, led our supply chain food safety. I then moved to operations, uh, where I worked on rolling out solutions, innovation work uh, to help mitigate risk in the restaurant. And then really the last two and a half years, it's all been about COVID response and recovery. And, and so that was on a team dedicated doing that for the last two and a half years. And that actually spawned a new role. Uh, so right now my new role is team member health and wellness. And it kind of goes beyond just foodborne illness. But how do we prevent communicable disease spread in the restaurant, including severe respiratory diseases? So I'm excited to be here. I'm going to ask the panel to come up in one, one moment. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll have uh, three panel experts come up here. And they're going to talk about what the last two and a half years has meant to them personally, as well as professionally, and just talk about the challenges that they had to overcome, not only then, but also the challenges that are ahead um, as well. But before we do that, I, I want to talk about just three things that I learned over the last two and a half years uh, dealing with the pandemic. Number one, large challenges need large support. Large challenges need large support. Internal support for us was critical. Small team that, that I was on, we were able to meet with the EC at least twice a week, provide them information, provide them recommendations, and we were able to get resources and really cut through a lot of bureaucracy, uh, which, was, which was phenomenal. We had to be agile, we had to be flexible, right? We had to keep a pace uh, with the virus, with coronavirus and how fast it mutated. So remaining agile and flexible. And I love the military um, reference that you used, right? I'll, I'll call it the OODA cycle. Observe, orient, decide, and act. And so that was constant within our team. Observe, orient, decide, and act. And then constant communication to the field. External support, just as critical. This meeting is so important. Dennis, I know we spoke on the phone a few times. John Zimmerman, we spoke on the phone. I may have spoken on the phone with uh, some of others before, but external relationships, probably more important than those we have with the CDC, those we have with the state health departments. One thing that was new for us is we did establish a relationship with Emory Healthcare, especially for COVID, right? What was really going on in the hospitals? They were involved with the Moderna vaccination trial. Like, what's going on with the data uh, not only with the new variant or severity, but also what's going on with vaccination. And I think that's going to be important moving forward, expanding those external relationships. Lesson number two, we are operating in an extremely complex environment. And, and you guys know that. Not just the virus, not just how it mutated, how it changed, um, you know, Back, or what, immune escape, or there's so many new terms, right, that we had to keep up on. But the social issues, the political issues, uh, which were a mess, obviously, uh, unclear regulations, misinformation. The public health experts almost became enemy number one, right? When we started, people started questioning our credibility, right? So just complex situations. Now you got staffing challenges, you got supply challenges. And what do you know about complex situations? The outcomes are very hard to predict. In the last two and a half years, right when we thought, I think we were in a good place, boom, something would happen, unpredictable, we'd have to go back in that cycle again. So finally, you know, number three lesson that, that I learned is you have to be ready so that you don't have to get ready. And by no means were we prepared for the pandemic. Uh, healthcare wasn't even prepared for the pandemic. But years ago, we targeted norovirus as public enemy number one. And we put strategy, we put a team in place, resources in place, hiring communications people to sit on our team because we aren't the best at communicating it. Hiring IT people as well to help us push the digital initiative, right? Diversifying our team helped us very much uh, with COVID. So with that, I wanna introduce the panel. They can go ahead and come on up here and I'll give a quick bio. Um, our first speaker is gonna be Thomas Yurchak and he's with O'Charlie's. 
So Thomas is a seasoned uh, professional with 20 years experience in retail food safety quality assurance and he leads that group as the director of food safety with restaurant growth services. Thomas's true passion, I love this, building a continuous improvement of food safety culture through partnering with operators, supply chain, training, culinary, and strategic supply partners. So our next speaker um, that will go after Thomas is going to be uh, Corin, uh, Corin Howard with Wawa. And Corin is a senior regulatory compliance supervisor with Wawa and was responsible, is responsible for ongoing collaboration with Wawa's network of, <laughs> of a thousand locations in rapidly growing markets. She also leads the associate health program with, uh, for Wawa's over 40,000 employees as it relates to foodborne illness and other communicable diseases. So, <laughs> yep, sure. And then finally, finally we'll have uh, Sarah Herringshaw with Wendy's. And Sarah is the director of restaurant uh, quality assurance for Wendy's and is responsible for establishing and ensuring, I love this, and I love what you said at our table, establishing and ensuring science-based food safety brand standards. I love that, science-based, and making sure that those are upheld with all global Wendy's restaurants. So please welcome uh, Sarah as well. And Thomas, if you'd like to get us started, if you'd like to get us started. Okay, I didn't know I was going first. So. Yeah. Hello, everybody. So. Uh, are, are, are we asking questions? No, nah, so this is, we want to 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes okay. with your, kind of your experience over the last two and a per half years. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit of a different route than COVID per se. So can I see a show of hands of everybody in the audience that works not only with food safety, but also quality assurance and products supplied by our suppliers? So it, it's quite a majority of the group here. So good, because that's what I'm going to talk about. So oftentimes, as leaders in our industry and our community, we focus primarily on food safety. And COVID led us to a position to where we were obligated to focus 130% of our time on that. So, you know, food safety kind of overtook the quality side of our jobs. And when we look at things and we talk through uh, right now, there's a lot of different things in the industry that are causing issues. And it's not necessarily COVID at this point, but we're seeing container ships stuck out in the water. We're seeing pricing go from $6,000 a container to $35,000 a container. We're seeing issues with labor at the production facilities. And we're seeing retraining uh, sparse at production facilities. We're seeing changes on the quality side because we're having to institute new ingredients because proprietary ingredients are not available uh, anymore. And we have custom suppliers that are reducing SKUs and saying either you change to something that is wholesale or we are not gonna produce your product anymore. So in the interim, what we are faced with, and you know, I believe it's, uh, I've talked to several people over the last couple days here, is we're facing with it. There's decisions being made from um, culinary. There's decisions being made from supply chain that uh, are in the benefit to the operators to get them what they need to be able to produce meals for our guests. And at that point, uh, is there sometimes we suffer uh, quality. And so what I've been working on with our teams is uh, ensuring that we have solid communication and we know when things like that are gonna happen. Um, and if we do approve a sub, which how many people, show of hands in the room, have had to substitute menu items or SKUs coming into their restaurants over the last six months? Okay, so uh, we're not talking to-go packaging, which I know is a headache for a lot of people in the supply chain world, but we're talking about proprietary food items, uh, dressings or main menu ingredients. I've talked to several people in the chicken uh, world over the last day and a half and you, you know they're seeing subs in whole meat muscle chicken so uh, and you look at the things that are going on out there is when do we draw a line and say the quality has to be on point and how do we communicate that to the people we work with uh, you know and uh, Dr. Lyon when he introduced me is a collaborative effort of culinary and supply chain, QA, training, marketing, everybody, because marketing wants something to come out in two weeks 
and the lead time from a supply chain may be six weeks, right? So it's having that constant communication between all departments. But at the end of the day, as a quality assurance and a food safety liaison for your company, you should have the final say on whether that is acceptable or not acceptable. And we reached that by getting buy-in from our C-level suite. So it was great to see the uh, president of uh, First Watch up here earlier today with an extreme buy-in of a food safety culture and the trust that he has in his quality assurance and food safety team. Because I know for us and uh, my restaurant group is we communicate very often to our CEO, our president, our chief concept officer, our chief supply chain officer on what we're doing and how we're controlling and managing the supply chain. And with managing the supply chain, the quality of the products that come through are imperative to be at an acceptable quality. And you know, when we look at how that comes across and how we look at quality is, right now we're working reactively um, because the, the supply chain is forcing us to react. Uh, and say, okay, well, we're either not going to have this product or we're going to have a sub-product. And uh, in a conversation earlier today, a great point was made up, and, uh, you know, that could change allergens. So who else does that affect, right? Changes nutritional information. It changes all those different components that just don't affect the supplier and just don't affect the supply chain. It affects our guests. And... In, in my company, our chief supply chain officer who I report to and uh, our department, our customer is the kitchen manager. Uh, at the end of the day, when it comes through quality, it comes through food safety, and it comes through uh, supply chain, that product that goes to the restaurants, our customer is the kitchen manager. Can they be successful? Can they be happy? Because you know, if you continue to get quality complaints submitted through your system and you're seeing issues with that, then the buy-in of your entire team, of your quality assurance, of your supply chain, is now being compressed down and down and down and down, and you have to rebuild that back up. So one of the things that we instituted uh, prior to COVID and continue to work through is proactive audits on high menu items. So primarily proteins, seafoods, beef, chicken, um, and we pull that product in and we judge that for quality. Um, we do a complete audit on cases that we pull from our distributor, not ask from our supplier, and we give that feedback to our suppliers and we bring the buyers into that as well in our culinary team and we discuss it as a group. And that helps build the camaraderie between the inner offices and we go ahead and we build the relationships and then the supplier knows that if something said no, it's a team effort, it's not just one person saying no. And that helps go to our leadership team as well because if we have to tell our leadership team that we're gonna have to 86 hamburgers for two weeks because the quality's not there, then we better have buy-in and a group effort that leads to that uh, decision. And uh, in our organization, if we make that decision because it's what's best for our kitchen manager, what's best for our guest, and what's best for the brand, then we will have that buy-in and figure out, well, what can we do to get there faster? So whether that's going to the plant to figure out what's going on, or if that's bringing BMEs back into the restaurant for every production run moving forward until we're satisfied. Uh, you know, currently we have chicken tender, whole split chicken tenders that they're sending BMEs 120 pounds of chicken to our test kitchen every week that they produce for us as, so that we can review that. So if anybody's in Nashville and wants to come help count chicken tenders, <laughs> uh, please give me a call. So it's glamorous, I, I guarantee you. So at the end of the day, uh, we look at a holistic approach and I think that you know, as we focus on food safety, which is paramount, which is number one, uh, and that's why it's food safety and quality assurance in the title, right? Uh, we can't let quality assurance go by the wayside. We need to focus and we need to ensure that the products that we're receiving are getting to our restaurants and, and celebrating our brands appropriately. And uh, the last thing that I'll say about that is, right now, who has had suppliers say the issue with quality is because of labor? Okay. So labor's huge right now, right? Especially when you go back and you look at the work environments of a lot of these production facilities, a lot of people don't want to work in that when they can go out and they can make money doing other things because the job market is wide open. 
So how do we educate our supply chain and our um, suppliers to help reduce turnover and provide a better product for us? Well, what we can do is we can work together with them in a team or in an atmosphere and ask the question, what could we do as a brand to help make it easier for your production team? And by doing that, a lot of the suppliers will come back and say, you know what, not a lot of people ask us that, but if you move this to a quarter ounce variance this way, or if you change the packaging on this, then we could run it with this, and we could do that. And, and for us, that has led to a lot of changes in the quality and the consistency of product for corporations and production facilities that are short staffed because at that point, it's less independent training for specific production. If we ask the question, what can we do? We review it, we approve it, or we don't approve it, and then we continue to hold them accountable by creating an action plan that can be successfully achieved by the production facility, and we follow up on that with BMEs until we're satisfied that it's compliant. So that's my two thoughts. All right, thank you, Thomas. Corin? I guess I have to. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Corinne Howard, and uh, of course, now I just lose my voice. Um, I am from Wawa Food Markets. So, for those of you that are not familiar with Wawa, we are a convenience store chain um, that operates along the East Coast, mostly in the Mid Atlantic, and uh, also in Florida. We actually have most of our stores now in Florida uh, in our operating area. We uh, also sell fuel and we have a dairy operation um, that's located in Wawa, Pennsylvania. It's actually the name of the town that we, uh, we operate out of. Um, we have currently about 46,000 associates um, that work at store level and at our corporate office. Uh, what else exciting can I tell you about Wawa? Um, prior to coming on board four years ago, I came from the dark side, the <laughs> regulatory side of the world, and I know there's other former regulators here, so I say that lovingly, um, but my, uh, my role amazingly at the health department was you know, very parallel to what I do at Wawa, so I currently oversee our associate health program, uh, which covers all of those store associates and our um, corporate as well. So what that looked like on a normal day was, you know, an occasional salmonella, E. coli, um, someone with an infected toe that felt the need to report that, and, uh, you know, occasionally we would get things like measles even or tuberculosis. Um, but then, much like many of you, my role took a completely different direction when something called COVID came along. Um, so it, since then, it's been two and a half years of all COVID, all day, every day. Um, and it's been a, a learning curve for all of us, I would say, as an organization. Um, prior to the pandemic, we did do some tabletop exercises, and um, it was really one of those things that seemed abstractly far off in the future and you just hope would not, would not happen. Um, so while I'd like to say we were prepared, I think there was uh, certainly a lot of lessons learned for us. Um, we're still learning a lot of lessons through COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm here to, I guess, talk about some of those, and. and uh, Hopefully you can relate. I do feel this whole session has been very therapeutic, just talking to different people <laughs> and uh, knowing that maybe I'm not alone in what we're doing at Wawa. Um, so some of the, the things that we did, our team was uh, solely responsible for pretty much all of the COVID response. So I'm sure you can relate that was regular calls with every health department uh, under the sun who had different regulations, um, different requirements at store level whether it was between plexiglass or masking, and then you're not masking. Um, we did have the, the benefit of being able to open and operate um, from day one. We never closed our doors uh, because we were an essential provider and you know, obviously having um, first responders and doctors and nurses needing somewhere to get groceries or fuel, uh, we were able to stay open. But with that came um, a lot of uncertainty for our associates. We've, prior to the COVID, had a number one commitment to our associates that their health and well-being was um, on the front um, and, and top of our priority list. But now is our opportunity to prove that and show that to them. Um, so we went through some challenging times. It's almost hard to remember, and it's probably a good thing, but I'm sure you've been in the same boat. We had um, associates there from the very beginning that, that got sick, and they had family members that were sick. And, and unfortunately, we have some of them that aren't with us you know, here. Um, today anymore. So, you know, as frustrating as all the masking and all of those things were, we have to kind of keep sight of where we started with this, and uh, we would not be anywhere without our store associates getting us, getting us through that. Um, 
some other pieces of that uh, were reporting cases, and I'm sure you've all done that. Um, we had to go through quarantine and isolation guidelines that changed every 10 minutes, it seemed, from the CDC, and uh, trying to understand that. There was times you would get on the phone with the health department and they wouldn't know what we were talking about or why we were calling them and reporting cases. Uh, and then others, you know, if you hadn't reported within 24 hours, they were very quick to contact you and want to know what was, what was going on. Um, so I had to take notes because there's, like I said, so many lessons learned um, through COVID. So I just wanted to maybe touch on the three that still stick in my mind as most important. Um, the one is really needing to look at our associate health and wellness program um, from a more holistic lens and um, not just, not that there's not value in having smoking cessation programs and walking programs, um, but really trying to understand associate behavior. And it's a fine line to walk because we are a food service operation. We're in business um, to sell fuel and food. And so it's, it's a tough, um, tough sell to people up the chain maybe of why um, public health is so important for us as an organization. Um, I do need to back up. My background again is, is public health, so it is near and dear to me. Um, so it's, you know, it's trying to get others on board. I'm sure many of you can relate prior to the pandemic. There was probably many people in your own organization that didn't even know what public health was through no fault of their own, um, understandably. So really trying to look at our associates um, through a different lens. We had, uh, one of the things we did was set up vaccination clinics for our associates, which we thought was gonna be the best thing ever and so well received. And we had uh, you know, sites set up at stores actually, so associates didn't have to, to leave and, and go get vaccinated. And then we found out no one wanted to show up and they uh, wouldn't make eye contact with you. There was no one in line to get the, the vaccine. We did also you know, offer a monetary incentive and uh, regardless that did not um, really break through why people didn't want to get vaccinated. So we started to look at things differently. We started having town hall meetings and including um, some of our, our experts um, that we consult with, whether they be doctors or nurses, um, I know someone had talked about you know, tapping into academia. We had a great epidemiologist uh, from the University of Pennsylvania that would get on calls and we would really just try and go through what associates understanding was and dispel any myths. And that, that did certainly help kind of move the marker a bit for us. Um, so as we move forward and beyond the pandemic, one of the things we were working on prior was hepatitis A being a very you know, large risk for us as an organization. And one of the things you know, at Wawa we, we need to get real about and we're trying to, to get to a better place is that we have associates that are homeless or experiencing periods of homelessness or that um, use intravenous drugs. So whether we, you know, as an organization want to admit that or not, we kind of have to meet people where they are to understand what community problems they're dealing with, what personal problems, and, and try and address that um, rather than just you know, telling people to go wash their hands more or to practice better hand hygiene. Um, so we're trying to, to look at things a little differently. Um, how we get there, we're still trying to figure out, but uh, we know that it's, you know, we need to have a more comprehensive associate health program. And another facet of that is certainly mental health. And I think whether you're at corporate level or you're at store level, that's something that um, we need to, to you know, get, put more focus on and try and um, assist our associates with. Um, so another, another thing that was kind of a surprising lesson to me, and this is coming from the regulatory side of the world, um, is that we actually at Wawa play a very important role in our community, probably bigger than we, we thought. So we do a lot of community events and support um, you know, partners that are, are charitable organizations that do great things. Um, but what we didn't realize is that when all the other you know, restaurants, unfortunately, were closed, um, Wawa was kind of a central hub for the community. People would, would come in and try and get, why they tried to get it from us, I don't know, but they would try and get information on the pandemic and they would um, be asking associates for medical advice. I mean, you know, it's for better or worse. So we had uh, a lot going on there. But we did find that, um, you know, we could work with the health departments and um, other partners to try and deliver information and they used us kind of as a vehicle to get that information out. We actually had several uh, very successful, the state of Delaware was a big proponent of this, um, large vaccination clinics and they would come and set up shop in our parking lot. The uh, National Guard and Delaware Department of Health, they would come out, I, I think at least twice a week to different stores and just kind of meet people where they are, get your coffee and get a vaccine for COVID. Um, 
So there was, you know, an interesting, you know, role that we played in that. And, you know, the thing I try and remember and share with our team is that, you know, healthy communities, uh, we work and live in those communities as well. Healthy communities really support a healthy economy and getting things back moving in a good direction. Um, so we, as we move forward, are looking for other opportunities to continue that, um, that community outreach and see what kind of partnership there is with uh, regard to hepatitis A again, or flu shots, or, or just other things. So uh, anyone that has any creative ideas that might have worked for your organization, please um, feel free to send my way. I'd love to hear about them. Um, and then probably just a final thought again, and Steve, I know you touched upon this, you stole my thunder here, but uh, you cannot stress enough the importance of partnerships with both regulatory and industry professionals. Um, I can say this from my previous experience at the health department, there is a lot of, uh, and this goes both directions, um, resistance at times to have those open lines of communication and there's sometimes, um, I guess, a misunderstanding as to why a, a business or a retailer would reach out to someone that regulates them on one hand, uh, but there's so much opportunity there, and I think we have a captive audience. I think a lot of health departments realize through the pandemic that they can't do it alone. They don't have the resources. Um, we were in a position that we were able to, to show many health departments that we could do contact tracing. We have, uh, we're keeping very detailed records of associates that needed to isolate and quarantine. Um, so many, if not all of them, had pretty much said, okay, go and do good with this. Um, you no longer have to report cases, but we want you to follow these protocols. So having those relationships prior to COVID were just hugely important. Um, there's nothing worse than having to cold call someone and you know, report a foodborne illness or um, a respiratory illness, whatever that may be, and expect them to have a little give and take with you. So um, that's something that's always been important to us, but we're continuing to build on it. Um, as you all know, when there's not enough time or enough uh, money in the budget to do things, it's events like this that go by the wayside, unfortunately, or it's those um, you know, meetings with your regulatory partners that kind of get pushed back and pushed back, but they yield you know, so many dividends for us um, in so many ways. And all of you, I would say personally, you probably are cringing because you've seen my name through an email go out you know, about COVID. Um, I know I reached out to the group many times to just see what you're all doing. Um, as we all know, food safety is not a proprietary uh, thing, and we all have a vested interest in making sure that people stay healthy and, and safe. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for you know, any um, advice, even here today and, and you know, last night, just the information that you're all willing to share. Um, I think I just told you this is very therapeutic and very, very helpful. So uh, I could go on and on. There's lots and lots of things. Um, for better or worse, that we, we learned. Uh, definitely don't buy uh, COVID test kits in bulk because we have about uh, 45,000 of them sitting in a warehouse if anyone needs any. So please let me know if you have a need in your organization. Um, but yeah, that's it. And I'm certainly open for questions when we're done or whenever we're ready. Yeah, we're going to do Q&A after uh, Sarah's done. Sarah's done here. Thank you. I thought I would talk about something that just happened to go in parallel with the timing of, of COVID, really. So for us at Wendy's, uh, we kind of embarked on a food safety journey about uh, you know two and a half years ago, or a kind of rethinking of, of the whole structure um, of, of kind of how we operate. And so um, under this umbrella called Wendy's Done Right, we have uh, first party auditing that's operations focused with a little bit of food safety. And that's done by our operations team members. Uh, and then we have third party auditing uh, that we've started to initiate as well. And so uh, I really wanted to talk about kind of how we've developed uh, that program in the last two years um, and what's become you know, important to us in the development of it as well as what the challenges uh, we faced have been in, in that time. So um, for us, when we looked at the development of the program, it was really about, um, you know, what, what Stephen mentioned is, is science-based program. And so um, with when... Sure. <laughs> yeah, with Wendy's being a global uh, company, you know, we're in 32 different countries, we really, really wanted to focus on science 
because that's what's going to transcend um, borders, right? And so while regulations are important to individual restaurants, we are focusing on the science uh, to build out that global program so that we could really uh, get a full buy-in across our entire operations. And so um, for us, we focused on the, the critical risk factors to build out the program. Uh, and we've been really pleased to see uh, kind of interest and buy-in and, and I can say that many of our general managers know what's critical when it comes to food safety now because of this. Um, what's really been interesting, I think, for us is balancing the approach. Um, when we thought about how to build out our program, um, you know, I, I think my first reaction would have been, make it unannounced, that's the only way we're gonna get real information. Uh, but as we looked at what we needed, which was partnership from our franchisees and from our operations partners, we, we went about it a little bit differently. We started with a coaching announced food safety assessment to teach people. Uh, we partnered with training and operations and even our legal department to build this structure out. Um, and so, you know, I guess personal lessons, um, you know, looking at it, my reaction was to say, let's do this fast, right? Let's, let's just get there. I'm not very patient when it comes to food safety. Um, but the reality is for something to stick, we've got to, to kind of bring everybody along. And so in the last two years, we started, you know, just over two years ago or just about two years ago with the coaching session, not even scored, uh, just results. The next few rounds have been scored with consequences. Um, and so that's the other part that's really important is in order to have consequences, we also need franchisee buy-in and operations buy-in. Um, and they have to understand that there are consequences to uh, not following policies and procedures. Um, but in order to have consequences, you have to take it a step back and, and build a continuous improvement mindset, right? So you, you kind of want to build the full structure um, and so that's, that's the way that we really have thought about it, is we, we built in uh, the tools and systems for the teams to continuously improve on their processes. So we're requiring things like self-assessments. We consider it an open book test. Uh, we're including corrective action planning. Um, back to the lesson learned from that, Corrective actions are only good as good as your root cause analysis, right? And so, you know, that was the first, one of the first gaps we've identified is, okay, well, you, you know, and it was kind of in the, the session that we, we just did, the, the training, um, people want to do the right thing. Uh, they have a general do the right thing when nobody's looking approach, but do they know how to do the right thing? That's, that's another key part. So that's what we're trying to balance um, and build into our system. And so I think it's been just a, a really interesting journey for us. And I think we're getting to a point now where we're saying, you know, when's the time? How do we, how do we transition to um, unannounced FSA, food safety assessments? How do we uh, bring our teams along to understand the, the value of announced because there truly was, you know, great value in having them announced because it taught people. They were able to have the right people on board. Um, they could have district managers and upper management there to learn along with them. But what we're seeing is the people who kind of do it best know um, how to build it out throughout the whole system. They know how to integrate a training manager, integrate the district managers, all the way down to some crew members in those self-assessments in order to prepare themselves. And we've really been preaching about a f everyday food safety culture, right? Doing the right thing every day, no matter who's watching, uh, being the promise to the customer. But until we get to the point where we're uh, really ensuring that continuous accountability, we're still just in the middle of that journey. 
I think, is, is where, what, we, um, what we're acknowledging right now. But the really neat thing about our um, structure and design, which I can't take any credit for, but I'm, I'm trying to drive the bus to it right now, is we have a check and adjust period. So we have five months of assessments, and then we have a window to look at the results, to make reactions, to take steps to alter procedures, educate, and really I use that data in a way that can drive change. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time trying to educate people in words that they'll understand that helps us get to a point where we're driving the culture in a better way versus just saying, well, you know, this is the rule and that's why uh, I think we're starting to see people really build out the understanding of, um, of a lot more of the depth. And, and that's why the risk factor focus is really important for us too, is for people to be able to focus on, you know, these five or six things, you know, sub buckets, maybe 20 things that you've got to do every day and then there's, you know, maybe there's a hundred more that are all just supporting factors. But if you do these 20 things, that's, that's going to get us 95% of the way there. Um, and so for us, we went from a point where we had procedures and processes that people understood how to do them, but they didn't understand what piece and part was critical um, and where they, you know, where they really needed to react. So today we're getting to a point where people are starting to understand how to react um, and what's critical. And, and then I think a, a second piece of that is we're also seeing, I mean, you know, in, in all honesty, we're seeing behaviors we don't like from announced audits, right? We're seeing things that <clears throat> naturally happen from, from people who know that, a, that an assessor is coming. Uh, and we were able to take health inspection data and correlate it to food safety assessment data to make that really speak volumes to say, announced is doing something for us, but it's not yet having the impact that we want it to have uh, on health inspections. And that's a really important KPI right now uh, because those are unannounced. And so, you know, just, just trying to find the right influence uh, to bring our leaders along and gain comfort has been a really critical process for us um, in this journey. Uh, like I said, for me personally, it's been a challenge because I um, don't have very much patience when it comes to food safety, and I think it all should go fast, right? So it's, it's been a balance of understanding that, that the impactful long-term change is going to come with uh, that slow uh, kind of patient alteration of, of mindsets and procedures and processes. So I think that's been the biggest thing, you know, totally unrelated to COVID. We rolled it out despite COVID, I guess I would say. No. Um, but that's been one of the biggest things we've been really uh, fighting through and, and growing through in the last two years. All right, great. Yeah. For us, I think uh, having a score is really important. Um, we focus more on number of critical risk factor categories versus you got a 78 versus a 98. Um, but having teeth in the program, I think, has been uh, a really important concept. In our design, you can get to the point of default and termination as a franchisee for the results of your assessment. But we built into it training uh, and response and support and multiple chances to kind of get back on the right track so that we're lifting them up and giving the best chance of success versus just get out, you know? So I think that it is a gaming the system issue at times. I mean, it, especially with announced. Uh, with unannounced, I think there'll be less of that because they just, you don't know when you're going to be visited, you're gonna to have to perform better every day, I believe. So, my two cents. 
Uh, I can add to that because I'm, I'm currently I have one brand uh, that we've been doing third party audits for several years now, and then I'm implementing it into a second brand uh, as we speak. So. With that being said, the very first audit we're doing is going to be an unannounced audit, and the report that will go to operations uh, will not have a score on it. Although the report that comes to me will have a score on it, so that way we can set up a baseline metric of where we're at. From an announced audit standpoint, we, we don't want to share score when we introduce a new program to increase the food safety culture and to continue to grow a food safety program throughout the years. So that's why we're doing it announced on specific days and we're asking every manager to attend that audit as well as the operational director to attend at least one in every uh, one of his markets and then regional vice president to also attend one. and. At the same time, we've added feedback on how, from our third party auditor, how interactive were the participants in the audit. And I think we gain a lot from that as well because it was, wait, we're in a rush, we're short staffed, so our, we didn't have anybody follow us. So we can gain that and we can actually gauge score behavior on who followed and who didn't follow. But at the end of the day, if you start a program or if you're rolling a program, the score doesn't matter. And it is the improvement of the metrics. Exactly what you said is how many criticals do we have on average? How many majors? How many minors? And can we improve upon that? So I'm a firm believer of score doesn't matter as long as you see an improvement. And when you see criticals decrease and you know, if you have the ability with your third party auditor to see a blind comparison of industry average of critical non-compliance uh, through third-party audits, and you can see you're up here when you first start the program, then you kind of inch it, and this is the baseline, and this is the baseline, then you finally hit, and you're even with industry average, and then when you hit that below, then that's when you, know, you continue to celebrate successes but not give up conquered territory, because one, there's always gonna be a critical to, to, to battle. So for us, we battle the criticals, the majors, the minors, but with the focus on the criticals, and you'll see score improvement. Uh, but you can't, for us, get a baseline until you do at least two or three rounds of audits uh, to be able to figure out where you're at because we customize. We just don't use an off-the-shelf audit. So when you customize, you have to create that baseline. I'll, uh, yeah. sorry, I'll also okay. add to that, um, and, and I think we kind of subscribe to a similar philosophy. We, uh, during COVID, did announced audits and actually did find some value, like you said, in having that opportunity to have the right people at the table to... Um, be present and really understand um, the purpose of the audit and why we're there and what the risk is to our company. Um, with that said, we're back to unannounced audits and we um, unfortunately do find that, you know, associates, they, they kind of operate um, to perform well for the audit uh, at times. Um, and we do have a numeric score, but the one thing we started doing was uh, giving points back this year. So we're actually allowing an opportunity for extra credit. Um, so they can get uh, up to three extra points, and they're all based around demonstration of knowledge. Um, so I was able to weasel in a few associate health questions uh, this go around, so I was happy about that. Um, and, and some of them are as simple as where, you know, show the auditor on the computer where they find um, the associate health table for, you know, diseases that they need to be restricted for, and uh, who do you call when you have a reportable illness. Um, so they, they like that. They feel like it's... Um, you know, a chance to get points back, and it's not like a gotcha kind of moment. Um, so I think we're going to continue to do that. We certainly can share with you how that how that goes. Um, but there's always going to be challenges, and that's on the regulatory side too. You know, you certainly know. Um, I'm sure many of you have been there when you know restaurants try and clean up the second you pull into the parking lot, and uh, <laughs> yes, they're covering everything quickly in the walk-in cooler and. Um, you know, so it's, it's about those coaching opportunities. The one thing we do, we have a third party audit, but then we use um, our internal auditors to go and do coaching. So stores that aren't performing well, they go out and really try and get to the heart of what maybe the challenges may be. And a lot of times it's staffing or you have uh, high turnover, new, new managers there. Um, and so they take the extra time to really like work with them and that, that's yielded benefits as well.
So um, we meet as a you know, quality assurance team. Uh, part of our audit, we did last year start integrating um, a safety component to our oh. audit. So pr before there was a food safety audit and then there was a safety audit, they've been blended together. Um, so at least one of the questions now um, is based on a safety question and our team knows you know, which question it's gonna be um, in advance and then it's, it's really just the auditor asking that question. So the unfortunate thing, and I'm sure we're gonna see this here soon, is that they, uh, you know, they all share information so they start to get an idea what the questions are. So we're gonna have to stay on top of that and maybe switch it up. Um, but we wanna have an you know, a, a, uh, even approach to all of them and we don't wanna ask one question to one you know, region and then a different question to another. Um, and you know, auditors can be very subjective too. So it's, we're still finding our way with that. It's not perfect. Uh, but I think just the, the one benefit that it shows that our team, we're not out to get you and we're not here to um, get you in trouble or to try and get you to, you know, leave the company. It's, it's you know, really understanding why we're doing this and there's a risk there. Um, there's a lot of work to do, to do there. And, uh, and I'm sure many organizations, they use these audits um, as a measure of performance and bonuses. And um, it's on our website and it's very clear every, uh, I think it's every month they post the standings and it includes the results of the audit. So, uh, so we have way to go on that, but we're, we're getting there. We're definitely in a better place than we were several years ago. Yeah, so I mean, every, Every year, uh, we have a sub-team within food safety. We call it RAM, Risk Assessment Mitigation. Every year, we spend two days, and we really, okay, we're going to reevaluate our risk from the previous year, okay? And this data, we call it SAFE, Safe Assessment of Food in, in the Environment. Um, we take that data. It is quarterly, uh, unannounced. Uh, we take that data, and it's a big, big factor into our, our risk prioritization. Now we look at other factors too, right? With, with what's the latest outbreaks, uh, emerging diseases, things of that nature. But we want, we want to drive, we want to drill down as deep as we can. It's not like, okay, there's a time and temperature issue. Okay, what is it? Is it the equipment? Is it the process? Is it a little bit of both? Um, but we use that data to change equipment which, you know, is, it can be expensive, right? Um, but hey, you know, the data will show, hey, look, it's, it's not the warrior, the person, the team member, it's the weapon. It, it's the piece of equipment, it's not sufficient. That data will help us tell us that. So that's one example. Hey, you know, we're, we're gonna have to get into equipment. Hey, there's other times where the weapon, the equipment or tools is fine. It, it is a opportunity for the warrior to get better. Uh, you mentioned Corin, um, y'all support team. We have a support team as well, and you know, they'll spend a lot of time in our worst performing restaurants because they know that they need the most support. But the advice, the counsel, the consult that they give them is from spending time in the best restaurants that we have and say, hey, look, you know, our operators that do best with the safe assessment, they have food safety goals, they have food safety leadership. Right? Here's the accountability. Here's what we've seen. Here's what they do. And they'll take all those learnings and take it back to try to make those um, operators that need some help uh, a little bit better. So it can lead to equipment changes, Jorge. It can lead to um, procedural changes. Uh, it's led to some menu deletions. Mm -hmm. Well, quite frankly, like chicken salad is a high risk menu item, um, it's no longer on our menu anymore. And so we, we use a lot of data, uh, specifically this, to help drive some of those decisions for us. Who's on your risk team? <clears throat> David, out there, who asked the first question. <laughs> uh, we have Emily Crispell, who we hired. Um, I talk about di diversifying our team. We hired her right before COVID. She is a virologist, which was really good to have, you know, during COVID. Um, her team le leads RAM, and so she's got two or three others uh, on her team, and, and they're really focused on, on risk, uh, specifically within our operation. And really, that we need to, we don't need to focus on the top 20 or 30 risks. We need to focus on the top five risks and put our, or put our, put our resources there. 
We have a, uh, a similar approach to that as well, and, and certainly looking at equipment. I think we do on a monthly basis uh, a scorecard by region. Uh, we have 11 regions that we operate out of. Um, so it's a breakdown and it's a hybrid of uh, collected health department data and then uh, from our internal audits. I, one of the challenges, as you probably know, with the health department data, you have some, uh, like the state of Florida, where it's an automated system and it's very uniform and there are beautiful reports you can print. And then, not to shame the lovely state of New Jersey, but we have, a, a, you know, you can get like a cocktail napkin with your report on it and that is acceptable in some areas. In some places you might not even get a health inspection report. So um, we still, I would love to hear how people are collecting this data. I know um, some of the third party auditors can do this for you. It's a very manual process. We have a person reading it and, you know, typing it in. So it's uh, a challenge there. But we use that scorecard and then it goes to our, you know, operations leadership and they try and look at, you know, through our, the lens of our team as well, uh, what opportunities there are. Do we need to do training modules on the computer? Do we need to look at a different cleaning product? Do we need to, um, you know, a lot more time to cleaning? Is, you know, cleaning has been a big one. It obviously stands out in my mind. Um, but, you know, it, it definitely drives, uh, you know, change at store level. So, um, yeah, anything you guys are doing, we would love to hear too. So The only other thing that I'd add, because I, I agree with everything that's being said, is there's a lot of data that you can pull. And if you really dive into these dashboards of these third-party auditors, is that you can pull data in different facets and you can utilize it in different ways. And one of the things that I, I believe that we've been successful in driving change and continual growth is that when we look at a non-compliance for critical is that we can sort it by critical non-compliance by operational director. So out of the 26 operational directors, their top five critical non-compliant are gonna be varied across the brand, right? So instead of focusing as the overall company top non-compliance, we focus on operational growth within their own markets. And we look at what is their not non-compliant per market. So say mine's cold holding over here, mine's cleanliness over here. We're not both working on cold holding when this isn't even a factor. It may not even be in the top three. So we utilize the data to drive and provide them with root cause analysis based on the feedback from the auditors and then you know the notes that are taken and we put those together with corrective action plans and best practices. And we review that um, and we provide not only the company top five, but we provide the, um, the individual to our senior vice president of operations who's able to really have that buy-in and filter that down and focus on their teams to drive growth and change. So yeah. use the data. There's a lot of data. Just don't look at the score. There's data <laughs> behind it, yeah. Yeah, I think everybody is struggling with staffing and we are seeing challenges. Pest, pest control is a, is a huge uh, challenge at times when you don't have enough people to, you know, respond to an issue that are, you know, local, for example, or we don't have the same quality of, of people in cases. Um, what are we doing about it? I think it, at this point is case by case. Unfortunately, we're we're trying to patch with the employees we have, um, and and try and identify with the data that we have as quickly as possible if there are gaps. Um, but just communication is is the best we can do right now. I think with the vendors to try and um, cover gaps. Unfortunately. Yeah, and you know, when you talk about service related uh, labor issues and gaps of that nature, it's for me, I, I've become so close with our national account managers, and I let them know whenever we get a new one, is we're going to be best friends. You're either going to love me or you're going to hate me, uh, or both at the same time. And, you know, set the expectation is, you know, we should be able to reach each other 24 7 and find out and put an action plan together and hold them accountable. At the end of the day, it's holding them accountable to the contract and saying, you know what, we need the best service, what are you gonna do, when are they gonna be in place, and how are we gonna move forward, and what can we do to help? So, it's a partnership. I think those partnerships go beyond um, just even looking externally. For us, our, our pest control program falls under our facilities department. Um, so, you know, just being totally candid, there's at times a disconnect with the expectations um, and 
costs, of, you know, growing costs for services like that, um, guide decision making that go beyond our team. Um, so we kind of run into some conflict there at times um, and, and have to find our way through that. In a perfect world, all those programs would fall under our team, um, but it's, it's just not reasonable with, as you all know, the number of people you have, you know, on your, on your team at your disposal. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like um, <clears throat> most of the withdrawals, I guess is the word we'll, we'll put it, you know, really was from foreign material. It seemed like it was just every other week, you know, even if it wasn't us, but just in food track, it was foreign material, foreign material, you know, and it just, you have to wonder, you know, did labor, whoever's manning the x-ray machines, just not come to work, was preventative maintenance, maybe delayed on the x-ray machine. Um, but, you know, it's interesting, saw a study, right, where in 2020 through 2021, right, norovirus cases were down 61%, right, which is just as incredible. Um, bacterial enteric diseases, salmonella, E. coli, they were down, I think, 31, 31%. Um, however, the increase in foreign materials were, <laughs> were much, much higher. So hopefully suppliers, you know, we'll get that, we'll get that fixed. I'll take that one if you don't mind. That one's dear and dear to me um, <laughs> as I'm, I'm the one that gets to look at all these health inspection reports. Uh, so yes, I do see that um, they are asking more, you know, knowledge-based questions. Um, and, and unfortunately for us, sometimes I'll read the reports and it'll say we don't have an associate you know, health policy and we don't have, which we clearly do. We have you know, all these things in place. Um, so it's an indication to us that we need to go back and really educate them where these materials are and you know, where they can find them. Um, I have, so we, you know, I talked earlier about the, the importance of sitting um, with, with industry and regulatory and, and having these discussions. There are a lot of good opportunities um, for partnership. I know in Virginia, uh, we sit on the Food Protection Task Force, um, and there's a few other states that we belong to those type of groups. Um, and we get very candid feedback from the inspectors that, um, you know, this is a, a global problem. We're seeing this type of violation more so in, in restaurants. Cleaning is in a, in a not so great place. And um, so then it, we go back to our team and try and, you know, focus in on those areas. So um, it does seem like, you know, and, and this is just me keeping in relationship with some of, um, you know, my previous health department folks that, um, you know, violations are definitely on the rise. I, I mean, I couldn't quantify this for you right now, but I would say we definitely see more line items that we don't want to be seeing on inspection reports um, that tells us we need to go back and, um, you know, do some more training or, you know, further look into what maybe the reason is for some of those noted items. All right. Well, hey, help me just one more time congratulate Sarah, Corin, and Thomas. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it.